Did you know that right now there's a group of people running the business of their dreams? They are respected leaders in their field, working with clients they love and serving them profitably. Now, are they famous? Depends on who you ask. They're not signing autographs at the grocery store or taking selfies every five minutes. They're not trying to be everywhere on social media. Yet when they show up at trade events and conferences, they are recognized and sought after. They're the ones everyone else looks up to. They're the next generation of thought leaders in their space. So what's their secret? Well, they've become famously influential to the right people, and so can you. Today, we'll dig into the story of one of these leaders and deconstruct how they became micro-famous. You won't just come away inspired, you'll come away with a new strategy and a new way of thinking. So while your competition is scattered, chaotic, and chasing every shiny object, you can move forward with confidence and clarity. I'm your host, Matt Johnson, agency founder and author of Micro Famous. And if you're ready to become famously influential to the right people, let's get started. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode. I've got a fantastic guest here today, as I often do. Uh, but I really enjoyed this conversation. We got into some really deep tactical stuff on sales and lead generation on LinkedIn, which we don't talk about a ton on the show, but has been really successful for me over the years behind the scenes. Uh, even Gary Vaynerchuk said that, hey, look, if you're a service business, uh, the combination of podcasting and LinkedIn is really where it's at. Uh, he said that like a year and a half ago. It's still true today. Uh, and my, my guest today is a perfect example of that. Uh, Paul Higgins is my guest. He's a high performance mentor. He helps coaches and consultants build online businesses to fund their dream lifestyles. He's moving into kind of helping consultants on the higher end, uh, excuse me, and, and people uh, that have teams. Um, so consultants, coaches, speakers, trainers, um, authors, that sort of, of person. So basically, if you're listening to this podcast and you have a team, Paul is moving into uh, coaching more and more of those folks and mentoring those folks to scale up. Um, so he has a deep background in both the sales and operations side, and we'll talk to him a little bit about that in his background in the first half of the conversation. And in the second half of the conversation, we go deep onto LinkedIn and the things that still work that might surprise you, which it, sh it shocked me, um, the things that are working that uh, you may already know about, but you may not know how to actually implement them in your business. And you may not know that some of the things that are automatable or outsourceable. So we really went deep. I've done a ton of research on LinkedIn. I've interviewed a bunch of LinkedIn experts, so-called. And Paul said some things in this interview that really blew me away. Um, he absolutely knows what he's talking about. And I think at one point he said that he took on in a very short period of time around 120 clients almost entirely through his LinkedIn generation efforts. And it wasn't through just a bunch of outbound messaging and canned messages that you see people doing. 70% of it was inbound. And so we're going to talk to Paul about how he did that and how do you write content that people engage with and how do you get and structure that engagement. So there's a bunch of stuff that we get into. I'm really excited for you to listen. I hope you check out Paul, not only his personal site that's coming, uh, we talk about the strategy behind that, as well as the podcast Build, Live, Give, which I was privileged to be a guest on. And so please go and check out my episode of that show as well. And so without further ado, one of my favorite guests, Paul Higgins, let's bring in Paul. Paul, officially welcome to the show. Great to be here, Matt. I'm super excited. So I had you, um, had you on to my show. You were kind enough to have me on your show. So we'll be able to go into depth on some things that I wanted to ask you about that I found out about you just in the process of getting to learn more about you and being on your show. And so I'm really excited to dive into a few things. But when you run across somebody, especially in the coaching consulting world, what do you tell them that you do? Look, I tell people that I help one to $10 million service-based businesses effectively grow in two key areas. So one's in sales and one's in operations, but ultimately what that does is just deliver them more profit to live their perfect lifestyle. Yeah. When you talk to like coaches and like co consultants, primarily the people that um, they want to teach, train and lead people, what do you think they have in mind? Like when, when they think of the phrase dream business, I know we all have a little bit different definition, but like when, for the people that you work with that are the, your ideal people, what do they think is the dream for a coach or a consultant? Yeah, look, most of them are like me, Matt, they've actually, you know, been in corporate. So I've worked Coca-Cola for, for 18 years and, you know, I left because of my health, but they've left for many reasons. And particularly at the moment, I think a lot of people with COVID, you know, are making some really big lifestyle choices. Yeah. And, you know, they leave, they, you know, over the first sort of three to, to five years, they sort of build a business 
but it's mainly around them. So they're the key person that brings in the sales. They're the key mm-hmm. person that does a lot of the delivery. And so at the start, they wanted to build this dream business, which you know allowed them to not work huge hours, to spend more time with their family, to travel, you know, all those great things. But they realise they end up um, sort of like corporate. So they're paying themselves less money and they're sort of working, <laughs> working more hours. So, you know, people want the dream of, of freedom, which is which is fantastic. But sometimes they're the key person that gets in the road, which is um, you know, something I love to help people remove. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, I see it all the time. It's It's really hard to break out of that. And like you pointed out, it's, I think it's hard to break out because it takes a combination of both things like the sales and the operational pieces. They really do. It's, it's hard to find somebody that can help them out with both things, but they have to be done at the same time. Like you can't just build a kick-ass operational piece because if you don't have the sales to support it, you won't really be able to build something scalable behind the scenes. And if you build the sales machine that's throwing leads at you and then you take them on, you don't have the operations piece can like building out at the same time to keep up with it, you'll end up just taking a bunch of people off and then your sales will stop. So it's like, it's, yeah, that scaling piece is really hard because you've got to have somebody come in and either you have to do it all yourself and you have to do it all at the same time, or you have to get someone like you that like can help do both. Um, did you, did you know that you wanted to be known for that? Is that what you set out to be known for? Short answer, no. So, you know, when I left corporate, uh, I did coaching myself and I quickly realized as a coach, I made a much better mentor. You know, Coke was uh, a brand company, so I learned so much from them. But I'd also, you know, had just been a prolific reader all through my through my life and, uh, you know, whether it was self-development, business, you know, so I just wanted to share more. And being a pure coach, you know, mm-hmm. the all the value lies in you and I've just got to help you get it out. I wanted to actually mentor people. So I did that and I realized two simple things. And and one was that people didn't have enough time. So I started an outsourcing company and then people didn't have enough uh, of the systems and technology. So then I started a tech business and, you know, I was doing that for quite some time, but I was really focusing on uh, individuals which which was okay, but then I realized that actually, you know, people with teams, people with um, that have reached that sort of growth ceiling is people that I wanted to, to work with. So I'm just recently actually making that pivot. I'm launching a, a personal brand. But, yeah, so most, most of it was around individuals for a long time, but mm-hmm. now I'm pivoting more to, to you know, uh, individual coaches or consultants that have actually got teams. Yeah, because like as a as a business mentor or a coach to other entrepreneurs, essentially, if you work with individuals, you tend to work up probably what eighty percent of the time with people that are somewhere in the six figures. They haven't broken into that seven figure. It's the rare individual entrepreneur that does, um, and you're more interested now in working with people that are in that one to ten million mark. That basically puts you right in the reach of people that have built teams because it's really hard to reach that level without. Um, and I do think that's a lot of that's a transition. A lot of people have their Ion, what do you think is the um, the difference between working with a leader who has a team versus one that doesn't? Look, I think it's um, I, th- I think it's the ability to let go. Now, I know you know a lot of people say that, but it, it truly is that ability. You know, Michael Gerber with you know the E Myth talked about you know the baker versus the person that owns a, a, a chain of bakeries, and I think that's the key mind shift. And you know, I'm not saying that everyone needs to, to build a ten million dollar business. You know, you can be an individual coach, have a million dollar business, and ha- have a fantastic lifestyle. And you know, I've helped a lot of people achieve that. But for me, I think. You know, if you want to potentially um, sell your business because, you know, you work so hard in creating your own business, if you want to exit your business or you want to bring someone in to run the business, I think that's the transition you make at the next level. And that really is about letting go, focusing on the things that you're really great at, but bringing in the right, the right you know, mindset. You've got to have the right mindset, the right systems and the right skills to actually uh, let go and let others take it further than what you can yourself. Yeah, agreed. And I, th- I think systems is a big part of that ability to let go. So that be the the skill set of a leader to build systems, I think, is what paves the way for that letting go. I think if you just try to let go and you don't have the systems, then you get all the anxiety and not a lot of the, the benefit of uh, people stepping up and taking over. 
Um, but on the marketing perspective, like for your, your mentoring business, were you already starting to attract the upper level people just through the brand that you have now or, or is the brand intended to start attracting those people? Yeah, look, uh, in short, I was. And, and if you look at when I had my outsourcing and I had my tech consulting business, especially the tech consulting business, we were uh, targeting agency owners uh, around the world. And they were sort of in that, you know, they had teams of, you know, probably up to 20 people and they were probably more than, you know, the one to $5 million range. So I've definitely worked with uh, professional services and service-based businesses in that range. Uh, and then I had a bit of a health hiccup, mm-hmm. uh, which then meant <laughs> If anybody knows saw- your story, that's a drastic understatement, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so once, uh, so, so therefore I sort of changed plan and I just tried to do the, the easiest thing I could to, to help as many people and that's where I sort of went back to just solo because you know I had to sort of manage through my health and then now coming out the other side I want to market myself and go back to that next level. Gotcha so the uh, so tell me a little bit about the vision for the personal brand and a little bit about the strategy behind you know not just expanding the brand that you have right now for example. Yeah so you know um, my health story in in short so uh, at 18 um, my mum uh, walked out of a doctor. My mum looked me in the eye and, you know, it was that moment that I think a mum never wants is that the inherited condition that she saw her father die when she was 15, she had it, had a massive heart attack, um, had just survived, was now with me as well. It's a 50-50 at birth. It's a called polycystic kidney disease. And, um, you know, at, in that exact moment, I thought, well, you know what, I, I can't control this disease fully, but what I can control, I'm going to be absolutely brilliant at. I'm going to be, you know, and for me, it was all around high performance. It's like, how can I do the best in my sport, my work, and also my health? And, you know, that is is a burning passion that I that I worked very well through corporate when I first started my business. But as that disease really took, place like in about 2011 my doctor said if you want to see your grandkids you better you know make a choice here and uh and not work the hours and and the demands that you've got in corporate Mm -hmm. so i then went into um my own you know so about 2016 it really started to take hold and and i started to continue to market myself but it was a lot less and I sort of, you know, was helping people that helped me not think about myself, but it did mean that my personal brand or who I was, was, um, was less because I didn't want to let people down. Um, you know, in 2018, I nearly lost my life. Yeah. So it's like, well, I don't want to let people down. I want to build up this brand, you know, and then all of a sudden not be, not be able to help them. So that's probably why, I didn't build my personal brand. Now that I've had a healthy kidney transplant from my best mate and I'm uh, you know, back to, to almost full health, it's time to you know, go and help more people by launching that personal brand. Love it. And what's the, uh, what's the strategy for going out to the market? Um, I mean, you've got the build of give, you know, the podcast that I was on and yes. so you've got some mechanisms, obviously you're familiar with how to get on podcasts and things like that. Um, what are you paying attention knowing what you know about things like LinkedIn and podcasting? Cause you're deeply involved with both. What's the strategy to go to the market with the new brand? Yeah. So LinkedIn is definitely what I'm going to double down on. So, gotcha. uh, if you look, so the transplant in February last year, uh, started May really doubling down on LinkedIn Mm -hmm. and between May and December I had over a million views and 120 new clients it completely changed my world and now I run a community of around 70 coaches and consultants around the world helping them do a similar thing and and you know I'm just going to continue that strategy it's it's probably been 70 percent inbound i.e you know doing great content posting great content and then that's led to, to sales conversations mm. or the other one is outbound. And, and really the podcast has been a key component of the outbound where you're, you know, t- tapping people, potential clients on, on the shoulder. Yeah. I was going to say like, are you using them using LinkedIn in the sense that you're reaching out to potential clients to invite them onto the podcast as a guest or okay. 
Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So look, yeah. Um, you know, I, I interview um, amazing coaches and consultants from all around the world. And yeah, LinkedIn is a brilliant way of giving them value first. So, you know, you've been on my podcast. I, I give people uh, a great experience and in interview, but also give them all the social marketing uh, material so they can go and promote themselves. Mm-hmm. So that I find is a, is a great bridge because you know, most people that do outbound, you get, you know, uh, you know, I've, you know, we've got 10 mutual connections together, mm-hmm. uh, blah, blah, blah. Would you, you know, accept? Yes. And then bang, a, a sales pitch. So it's not always, but unfortunately some people still think that's a, a great way to build a relationship on, on, on the platform. Whereas for me, you know, I really want to get to know the person. So the podcast is a brilliant way to do that through the interview, Mm -hmm. but it also is a great bridge between, well, okay, I've connected with you. So now how can I add value? So to me, the podcast does that brilliantly. Okay. So what do you think, like you've run an outsourcing company before, so you've got a really deep background in how to use outsourcing to leverage yourself. And you mentioned that a lot of times people are hitting people on LinkedIn with sales pitches. So I see that's, that's one of the ways that I see people from the outside looking in, people using LinkedIn and using outsourcing, right? I don't want to do that necessarily. I only want to do it if it's authentic. And I think most of the people listening to this podcast would say the same. So what can you use outsourcing and leveraging you know, staff or interns or whatever to do for you on LinkedIn that doesn't feel inauthentic when you go to reach out to somebody? Yeah, look, great, great question. So if I go to the inbound, which is your content, so mm-hmm. I'll just take you through, um, you know, what I do. So I uh, create the content. So a post normally takes me about 15, 20 minutes to write. And what we've got is uh, I've got seven key elements to a post. So we've got a really good structure on getting the best out of a post. So an average mm-hmm. post for me will sort of get, you know, between 10 to 30,000 views. So, wow. so, you know, we've got a really good format. Now I'll draft that um, myself mm-hmm. in Grammarly and then I'll put it in a, a project management platform like Asana and then my team, so I've got someone in Columbia and she will basically go and uh, post that for me in US time while I'm asleep in Australia. <laughs> so she'll go and post that and what she'll also do is at mention 10, my, the last 10 people that I connected with within the post and then maybe some other key things. So today I'm doing a post on sales. So she'll go in and I've said, you know, go and at mention these people. So she's doing that for me. Then I've got another team member. Then he'll go and look at everyone that's liked and commented on that post and see if they're an ideal client. And if they're an ideal client, he'll then send them three to four messages uh, within LinkedIn on my behalf. Now, I've written the script on exactly what to say, but I've also trained that person on how to do what I call the hot potato. And the hot potato is simple that open is the best word on LinkedIn. So, you know, are you open to connect? Are you open to having a call? So we find that that word works brilliantly, but also, you know, what is your key focus? Because so many people go in and it's all about what they're selling to you, but how do you know what they want? And we've all experienced that. So, you know, they can ask the open questions and then what they do is put that into our sales CRM if it's a lead. If they think it's going to turn into a sales call, uh, once again, they've got scripts to manage that. And then I then take it over if it becomes a, a sales call. So, you know, if you think about it, one person's doing all the posting component. Another person is then doing all from the post to to um, me getting into a sales call. So so that works brilliantly. And there's other quick little things like birthdays. So I've got a video where I say happy birthday to people. So that's done by my team. I've got anyone oh, that's generic like video profile. they can store and they send it out through messages. So upload it right in the messenger. Perfect. Love it. Correct. And we use Dub, D U B B. It's a okay. fantastic uh, platform. And yeah, so I, and, and I can record other messages. And what I've also done is little value videos. So, um, you know, someone's LinkedIn profile might be up to what we think is best practice. So we'll send some tips if uh, they're putting links in their posts, which LinkedIn don't really like, it mm-hmm. downgrades the posts. We'll send a little video on that. So my team is sending that. It's me talking mm-hmm. and it's me giving value, but my team is sending that on my behalf. Right. Okay? So I know it's a little sneaky. It's not exactly me, but 
you know, I'd send the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so, so that's another component. So, so that's the inbound piece. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and sorry, anyone who's uh, viewed my profile as well, they send it. And the most important one is connections. Okay. Right, so if someone listens to my podcast, reads a post and sends an inbound connection, they actually, before they accept it, they say, uh, you know, thanks for asking for the connection. Um, you know, did you come across me through my podcast or through my post? So what it's doing is actually giving people some context why they're reaching out to you and that gives you a greater chance of knowing who they are to accept it. So I'm not just building a network for network's sake. And that also does give uh, the opportunity then to, you know, maybe take that into a sales call. So they're all the inbound things. Uh, So I'll just, sorry, I know I'm uh, rattling off a lot here, Matt. Any questions about the inbound before we go to the uh, outbound? Um, well, I guess on the inbound side, in terms of the content that you feel like is working on LinkedIn, has anything changed just in the last year or two? Look, uh, not in the last 12 months, to be yeah. honest. Um, the, the, there's basically nine themes. So I won't go through all the nine themes now, but you know, mm-hmm. there's certain themes that you can do and there's thir- certain formats. And the formats is sort of four formats. So text only still works better than anything else. Really? Okay, now that surprises people, huh. you know, visual seems yeah. to be better, but it's not text only is best. And once again, no links in the text only. Then the next is a document, right? So a PDF, you know, you can create any of your IP. And I keep saying to people, you know, you, you're brilliant at what you do. Why don't you show more people? So just mm-hmm. show some of your IP in a PDF that they can download straight away and have the call to act call to action in the download. Mm-hmm. The next one is then a photo, but the photo and text has got to be something that is, you know, is about you. It's real life. People you know, don't want something that is generic out of, you know, Photoshop or, or some of those brilliant platforms. Mm-hmm. You know, we can all do that. So it's got to be a, a, a personal photo is best or mm-hmm. a photo that really tells the story. And last mm-hmm. is the video. And the only reason the videos last is because it's three seconds is a view versus the rest is one, you know, is, is just a, a flick in the feed. So with a, a video, you know, you'll, you'll get lower views, but you'll get much higher engagement. So I always recommend doing a video sort of once a week, people see you more, you can repurpose the video, but they're the sort of four key formats that seem to be working the best. And that hasn't really changed in the last 12 months. And that's really interesting. Yeah, I've been keeping uh, keeping track a little bit of just what people are doing on video and, and just be thinking about is that is that what people are moving on to. So it's good to know, like it's, um, if you're a reader and a writer, it can be a little bit discouraging out there because people primarily seem like they're moving into audio and video and away from text. But LinkedIn sounds like it's a little bit of a uh, respite from that overall trend. Yeah, and, and with a video, you know, you still have text on it, right? So I always recommend captions. I, I forget the exact stats, but it was like 70% of people don't actually listen to the audio. They'll mm-hmm. just watch the text. So make sure you have captions, maximum two minutes. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we use a little formula called promise. So, you know, the P is what's what's the actual promise. Oh, sorry, it's poser. <laughs> Too early in the morning here in Australia. So <laughs> first one is your promise. Mm -hmm. Uh, then what's the key obstacle? What's the solution? What's an example of how you solve the solution? And the R, to me, the R is about, you know, what's a call to action. So, you know, if you have that little framework nicely embedded within your video, I think that gives people maximum value. Got it. Love it. So you're taking a framework that you're already really familiar with, you know, it works. And then effectively on LinkedIn, for this new strategy with the personal brand, you're just changing who you're reaching out to. The methodology is the same, right? So the target is a little bit different. Let's talk about the targeting part of it. So you have a pretty good idea of the type of person that you're looking for. So let me ask you this. Is it a type of person that is hard to identify amongst a group of a bunch of other people that look very similar until you start talking to them? Or is it to the point where without ever talking to them, you can get down to where, you know, like actual names and faces through, let's say, LinkedIn research? Can can you pinpoint it that much? Or is it more like a psychographic demographic, whoever responds to this kind of message is my type of person? Yeah, look, 
Most of it you can get on LinkedIn and LinkedIn plus their other socials, right? But remembering that a lot of these people are so busy doing the sales and the delivery that they're not putting out a lot of uh, content. So, you know, mm-hmm. it, it is looking at their profile and you can get you know, their team size, you can go to their website, see their offering, etc. But the key thing I'm looking for is high performance, right? I work with mm-hmm. people that are actually high performing people and you know that part you can only really get with a conversation and that's why the podcast is brilliant because you can really understand someone really well in 30 minutes through a podcast so that's that's important but also having the right structure i always um, believe in two sales calls so you have the initial call where you send them a set of questions that they ask and then you delve into those questions Mm -hmm. and you know that's normally about 15 30 minute call Mm -hmm. and then after that I then do the investment call and the investment call what I do is actually have I've got a a 29 step format on exactly how I'm going to deliver them the value so if I know the opportunity I really understand it I know them if they're high performing then I sort of go through that and it's just simple of you know here's the steps you need to get to where you want you know, how many have you got and, you know, can you get them there by yourself, the gaps, or do you want mm-hmm. someone to help? So it becomes very easy to transition that. But, yes, you know, you can see who the person is, but to really know the person, you've got to have that conversation. Gotcha. Okay. Love it. Well, this is awesome. So so I would call this a a podcasting plus LinkedIn strategy using the out using LinkedIn both for pulling people inbound through the content as well as reaching them outbound um, are you using any of the tricks of like profile viewing or mass connection requests or anything like that or just some of those things you hear from other people yeah so uh, so on the um, on the inbound uh-huh. we believe that there's uh, a simple rule and it's called the 50 20 60 so you need to get about 50 likes you need to get about 20 comments in the first 60 minutes. So in short, you can't do it solo, right? So that's why we've got a community that supports each other and we use a little bit of technology to help with the likes, okay? It's only likes that people would do anyway, but Mm -hmm. it does help with that. So that's sort of the, um, the out the inbound on the outbound reaching out to people um at the moment we've been doing that all manual so we've been you know using sales navigator and i've been using a person to actually send the information but we are at the moment investigating using some automation but you know the the Mm -hmm. key thing is that uh, with with linkedin you really only want to target 50 to 75 people outbound a day in the invitation connections and the, the other thing is if people don't accept a connection say in 10 days you should remove that uh connection request as well okay yeah. i assume so they're, they're keeping track of that looking at a percentage of connect requests accepted yes correct Perfect. okay correct. that makes sense yeah and, yeah, and the scripts good. make a huge difference there like i've got people that come into our program and they might be at you know 20 percent acceptance and we mm-hmm. we're around 50 to 60 percent acceptance so the the words mm-hmm. that you use really does make a difference no matter what you know whether they're doing it manually or or um, using automation so let me ask you this because i'm always interested in strategies that are evolutionarily stable in other words the more people use it they still work they don't become ineffective the more people use them so when you when you look at the things that you're doing and teaching on linkedin um the more people use them do they feel like they still remain effective or what is there certain things that you already know will need to change and evolve that you have your eyes on look i suppose from the the posting component linkedin um they make their money out of selling ads okay Mm -hmm. so that's that's one of the key revenue drivers for them. So the reason that people will come onto the platform is content, mm-hmm. right? Because if they've got great content, people stay on longer and they'll watch more ads, mm-hmm. right? Pretty simple. So I think uh, posting great valuable content on LinkedIn isn't going to change. Uh, I think that's going to be evergreen. Now, I know some other pl- platforms like Facebook and and others have removed the organic amount of um content and it's moved more towards paid I, I don't really think that's in the interests of linkedin you know most of the money they make out of at the moment is through you know like i said ads but also you know corporates 
etc. So the top end of town is where they make a lot of money. So I don't think they'll mm-hmm. change their strategy like Facebook did. Now, that's just you know subjective. I, I don't yeah. have any fact to back that. But if I just look at the the financials of Microsoft, the new CEO that's come in that's running LinkedIn from Microsoft, I think that's the strategy they'll take. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Facebook has been an interesting journey to say the least. If you look up Facebook organic reach in a Google image search, it's basically a bunch of graphs that go very angrily down to the right. <laughs> it's not, it's not fun. I was pulling them for a webinar here a few months back and it was just hilarious because it's just basically an entire page of angry looking down, downward graphs. Um, but that's good to know. Uh, and it's good to know that the things that you're, you're teaching and the things that you feel like you're good at and the methodology that you've developed is, is going to last because that's always something to worry about you feel like you have like you feel like you find this tactical advantage and then you're looking at that going yeah but if everybody did it it would stop working like like you know sending things through facebook messenger and stuff like that like you could just see a day where look if the average person gets more than 10 ish you know facebook messages a day they're going to tune out and it's just another version of your email inbox and i don't know what linkedin is doing but they seem to have done a good job of avoiding that fate yeah and and matt you know it's like uh to me it's just a new new coffee, right? So we used to all have coffee face to face and that's the way that we built, especially in service-based businesses because yeah. people are buying you ultimately, right? Yeah. They're, they're buying you to solve a solution. So, you know, for me, it's a solution to, to generate more profit, to live a better lifestyle and they're choosing me, right? So it's still a relationship game and that's been around, you know, ever since I don't know, Adam and Eve, like it's all around relationships. So you know, that's what LinkedIn is, is prime, uh, primarily built on. So th- I don't think that's going to change. So all yeah. we're doing now is like for me, you know, when I was post-transplant in my hospital bed for, you know, almost three months, you know, I, I just still worked as normal uh, with people all around the world. It was happening through LinkedIn. I was connecting with people through LinkedIn. I was adding value. I was having relationships, seeing where they were, where they wanted to be, where, where, whether I could help them or not. Now, those things are fundamental. That's never going to change. Mm-hmm. But I think LinkedIn just makes that a lot more you know, easier to do. And people know that you're there for business on LinkedIn. So I think, you know, I, I, yeah, I can't see that changing, uh, to yeah. be honest. Interesting. All right. So... We're, as we're recording this, this is July of 2020. So your personal brand is going to launch over the next few months. So how do people stay in contact with you now and where do they go so that when those things launch, they can keep in touch with you? So let's start there. Yeah, yeah. So my website's called Build, Live, Give. Mm-hmm. And that will stay the same. So think of that as being, you know, because I'm a Coke guy, I used to always build a company brand and then sort of the individual didn't stand out. So I built buildlivegive.com. That's not going to change. But what I am going to do is launch paulhigginsmentoring.com as okay. my personal brand. Gotcha. That makes sense. And then tell us a little bit about, we talked about where for you, the, the podcast fits in from a lead gen perspective. What do you think the listener pulls out of and is there is there anything specific that you want people to know about the podcast as to why they should get into it from a listener's perspective if they especially if they're in coaching consulting yeah look i think the best the best things to learn is from those that have gone before you right mm-hmm. so you know for the podcast what i try to do is you know like have people like you on it as an example where you know you've been in podcasting and podcasting production for a long long time so there's a lot of people know that podcasting is something they want to get into but it's like you know how do i do that so i get someone on like you on the show first i go through your story because every story is brand and unique and you can always learn from someone's story as to how they got there then exactly what they do so you know things that you know you've gained over the years of podcasting that me as a listener we could get huge value from and then also we've got a, a live give section which is you know what are the things that make you successful and every time you can just pick up a little snippet there or something to help you in your life and then the give section is about you know how you give back so it's a little bit about you and it's really building a connection for you so if someone on the podcast is listening they want to get a, you know, they get to know you more and what you stand for. And I think that's really important these days. And then we've got some action questions at the end where, you know, you give your top personal uh, effectiveness tips, some technology that you use and how you source new ideas and the impact you want to leave on the world. So it's all based around the listener. So they get maximum value out of going through those sections. 
Yeah. And I love that approach. Uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the difference between a podcast where you interview the same type of person and you ask them a variety of different questions. I think that podcast format can work. But, but if you want to interview a range of people, which you and I both do, um, I, I, I like that format where you're asking them similar questions because you're getting different perspectives and the audience has a really good idea of what they're going to get out of being a listener to the podcast as opposed to just being a guest. Uh, I think where we get into trouble as podcast hosts is podcasting can be really fun and it's awesome to chase all these random rabbit holes. But if we end up talking to seven different types of people about 11 different topics and somebody looks at our podcast feed and they go, I don't know what I'm supposed to get out of this. I don't know what problem this is supposed to solve in my life. Uh, and I think you've done a really good job of balancing that. Like when I go to your podcast feed, I have a better idea of who this is for and what I'm going to pull out of it as a coach or a consultant, even though you're talking to different types of coaches, consultants, like that consistency of questions in the format is really good. So I'd encourage anybody, just if you're listening, give that some serious thought because I don't think you can do both. Many different people, many different topics. I, I don't think we're living in that world where that works as well as, as the days of like, let's say John Lee Dumas came first coming out. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, I, I look at, um, my podcast, you know, what are the key things that I'm seeing? When I talk to clients, what are the key topics that they really want to know about? And then I get guests that have, you know, had an experience where they've, you know, had a career, now they're running their own business. So they've got that part of it, but they've also got specific skills. And it's a bit like um, there was a, a bank in Australia called Macquarie Bank, and they talked about freedom within a framework. So, you know, I've got my framework so people feel yeah. comfortable. I get the questions before, but I also don't ask the same you know, rope question every time and it goes in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think a combination like that's worked well. And I'm a podcast junkie. I listen to yeah. about two hours at two and a half times speed a day. And I'm always taking little snippets from other people to, to improve the format, but I sort of came to that after listening to podcasts for about three years thinking, well, what would I love as a listener? And, you know, I yes. am very similar to who my clients are. So to me, you know, that helped bring it together. Yeah. I, I love that perspective. I, th I think anytime you scratch your own itch, it makes it a lot easier to arrive at something that's really unique because you know when you found it. And I think a lot of us, when we go to start a podcast, would be really better served by doing exactly what you said, where you're listening in the conversations to your clients, asking yourself, what is the, what is the conversation going on in their head? What's the questions that they're asking? And let's go out and find out an expert that can speak on that topic. I think there's a lot of... Um, people in the coaching consulting space that think top down. This is what I want to say. This is what I want to yeah. train on. This is what I want to educate on. And then I'm going to push that content at you, uh, which is fine. Like if you have, like everybody's got a message for the world, but if you can start by tying that in with what your, your clients are asking, then you can, I, I think just get the best of both worlds. Yeah. And Matt, you know, we talked about it before about letting go, you know, is, is mm -hmm. one of the key things you got to do. But as you said, you know, one of the things with letting go is you've got to have the right people to let go to right? If, if you don't trust someone, it's very hard to let go. And to me, a lot of those people don't have to be direct team members, they can be experts. So, you know, what I do by listening to that many podcasts around the world is I collect the experts. So for example, if someone said to me, hey, I, I want to launch my podcast, I'd go, okay, great. Well, if you want to launch a podcast or you want your podcast to take it to the next level and get it produced, here's Matt. Okay. So uh, here's the interview that I have with Matt. Here's his skills and experience. And, you know, I know that I'm not going to be let down because when I left corporate, I thought everyone was a supplier like to Coke. You know, I just thought, you know, they were the best in the world. They said they, you know, what they said they were going to do, they did and everything was great. But I got ripped so many times, which is embarrassing, but it was true. And, and I've, you know, dedicated my time now not for my clients to ever have that experience. So if they need an expert to let go to, I can give them someone they can trust. Love it. Well, I knew I would enjoy the conversation, but this has been fantastic. And I, and I got to pick your brain about LinkedIn and, and you shared some things that were really, really surprising that I wouldn't have guessed. And I've done a lot of research on LinkedIn and we'll continue to do some more. So I want to get, uh, I'll, I'll touch basically behind the scenes about some of your resources and, and things that I might be interested in. Um, but Paul, this has been, Awesome. I so appreciate the time. 
Great. And uh, if, you know, to me, your profile, your LinkedIn profile probably ranks above your website. I certainly know that's for me in the way that LinkedIn are, are doing that with Google will continue. So if you want some tips on how to improve your LinkedIn profile, so, you know, that micro famous, I think it's so important that someone hits your profile and knows exactly who you help and how you help them. So if you just go to blgdownload.com, there's a free resource there on, on some tips on improving your profile. Perfect. Love it. Awesome. Paul, thank you so much. And uh, I know people got a ton of value out of this and, and hopefully we'll have you back in the near future. Talk about what you're doing with leaders of teams in the one to $10 million space. I'm excited to hear uh, some takeaways from that once you get deeper into that. Brilliant. Thanks for having me on, Matt. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Micro Famous Podcast. If you're ready to become famously influential to the right people, connect with us at getmicrofamous.com. It's the best way to take the next step to implementing the Micro Famous strategy in your business so you can attract an audience, build influence, and become the Micro Famous leader you're meant to be. And we'll see you on the next episode.